So welcome to week one of our online academy. And I would just like to remind you that all the training that's online has been approved and endorsed by the Royal College of Occupational Therapy. So this week we're going to talk about normal versus deviated posture. So let's start with the structure of the pelvis. And the pelvis is the key, the cornerstone to sitting. So it's important that you know the anatomy of the pelvis. And we'll go through this at a later stage in the training. So what is normal or correct posture? So normal posture is when weight is taken evenly through both ITs and the ITs are the ischial tuberosities or the bony prominences that you sit on when you sit down on a chair. So that's the ITs. The pelvis is in a minimal anterior tilt. The head is balanced and aligned above the hips and the feet are rested in neutral. So this is normal posture. But what is normal or correct posture? It's different for different people because it's what's most comfortable for the individual. It's what is most energy efficient. It is what is task specific because we change our posture depending on the task that we're doing. And it's what is less damaging in terms of function and pressure. So very few of us sit in this 1990 posture. So we're going to look at some of the uh, abnormal postures that you might see in your patients. And the first one that you might see would be posterior pelvic tilt. And this is also called sacral sitting. And it's common when people sit for long periods of time. So even in a normal uh, individual with normal posture, they may slide into this posterior pelvic tilt. And that is okay because they can correct that posture. But it becomes a problem when someone slides into this posture and cannot correct it because it can end up having associated pressure ulcers in the sacral, spine and heel areas. And in the posterior pelvic tilt, the PSIS is lower than the ASIS. So the pelvis is tilted backwards. So I'm just going to demonstrate that with the pelvis. So here we have um, a structure of the pelvis. And I want to point out the main parts of the pelvis. So here we have the iliac crest. And at the front of the iliac crest, there's two little notches and they are called the ASIS. And if we go round to the back of the iliac crest, the two notches at the back are called the PSIS. And then we sit on these two bony prominences and they are called the ITs or the ischial tuberosities. And that is what we sit on when we sit down on the chair. So in normal or correct posture, the weight is taken evenly through both ITs, the ASIS and the PSIS are level. So in posterior pelvic tilt, when someone sits, they sit sacredly. So they're sitting with the ASIS higher than the PSIS. And in this position, the weight is taken through the sacral area, which is why it's called sacral sitting. And this is where it can be very damaging because this area can be very prone to skin breakdown. So what causes posterior pelvic tilt or sliding forward in the seat? So the main reason may well be that the person has tight hamstrings. They may have limited hip flexion, abnormal tone, or their trunk muscles are unable to hold themselves upright against gravity. So when I'm doing an assessment and when uh, what I would encourage you to do is that you look at the clinical reasons why someone sits like that, but then you also look at the technical reasons. How is the chair contributing to this posture? And the chair may well be contributing if the seat depth is too long, if the floor to seat height is too high, if the foot plates are too low, so there's inadequate loading of the feet, if the back of the chair is too straight, the armrests are low, and if the seat depth is too short, there's inadequate femoral loading. So it's really important that when you're doing your assessment, that you look at the clinical causes and the technical causes. So as this webinar progresses throughout the coming weeks, we will look at assessment and how to assess for the, this. So what happens when someone sits in this posture for a long period of time? And we have to think about the effect this is having on their swallowing, their respiratory function, their speech and communication, their ability to digest food, the pain that is causing and the damage to the skin. So 
we're going to look now at anterior tilt. And just to bring the pelvis back up, in anterior tilt, the pelvis is tilted forward like this. So the ASIS are lower and the PSIS are higher. And in this position, the weight is going through the pubic region. So this area here is prone to skin breakdown. And so if you do have a client that has recurrent problems with this area, you may well think about how they're sitting in the chair. So it is the posture that we would use if we're sitting at a desk. The ITs are pushed backwards and the weight is going on the pubic region and the PSIS are higher than the ASIS. So what are the causes of this? If we're looking clinically, it may well be that there's weakened abdominal muscles, that the client may be obese, that there's increased lordosis, that's an increase in the lordotic curve of the spine, or there's tight hip flexors. And how might the chair contribute to it? If there's an anterior slope on the seat, if the back is too vertical, or there's an excessive lumbar contour on the cushion. So what's the effect of someone sitting long term in anterior pelvic tilt? And one of the main causes is the bladder issues, because when the pelvis is tilted forward, it may impede the flow of urine. And if someone is catheterized, it may cause a backflow of urine into the bladder. It also has a, a damage. It also has an effect on the person's functional ability. It can cause spinal muscle fatigue and damage to skin in the central pubic region. So now we're going to look at pelvic obliquity. And pelvic obliquity is common when people sit for long periods of time, and is caused by instability of the person or instability of the chair. So what it is is the pelvis is tilted to the side and the weight is going through one IT. So all the weight is going through one side of the body. It's associated with shear and friction, and we always name it according to the lower side. So if the pelvis is tilted like that, we would say they are sitting in a right obliquity. So what are the causes of this? Someone may well have a scoliosis. They could have hip dislocation or subluxation, or there could be asymmetry in the body. Asymmetry in muscle strength, asymmetry in bone structures, asymmetry in hip flexion, or asymmetry in muscle tone. So again, we want to look at the clinical issues first, and then we want to see how you may the chair be contributing to it. So if there's no solid base of support in the chair, so if it's a very saggy cushion, if the chair is too wide, the person will lean to one side to give themselves support, and this will cause the pelvis to tilt into an obliquity. If the arm supports are low or too high, so the seat does not support the femurs and feet, and therefore the footprint of sitting has not been maximised. Later again in the webinars that are following, we'll talk about loading the body and getting as much of the body in contact with the seat as possible. And this is very important to get even weight distribution. So if someone sits in a pelvic obliquity for a long period of time, you have to think about instability. And when someone is unstable, they'll end up fixing themselves in a seat. So they may cross their arms, they may cross their legs, and this causes instability. And instability can cause an increase in tonal patterns. Think about their function then. If someone is fixing in a chair, they're sitting with their arms crossed or their legs crossed, that then reduces their functional ability and increases their tone. And it can cause damage to the skin, and in very severe cases, in obliquity, sometimes the rib cage is sitting right down on the iliac crest and you can get a damage to the skin there. So the next one that we're thinking about is a pelvic rotation. And a pelvic rotation is when one side of the pelvis is more forward than the other. So when you feel for the ASIS, you will note that one ASIS is forward and one is back. So the pelvis is rotated like that. And we always name it according to the side it's rotating to. So if it's rotating like that, if this ASIS is rotating like this, that would be a right rotation. So usually there's some level of pelvic rotation and obliquity at the same time. And you always name it according to the side it's rotating to. Now in um, a client sitting on a chair, you may well notice a leg length discrepancy. That's usually a clue that the person is sitting in a pelvic rotation. So what are the causes? 
They may have a leg length discrepancy due to a hip dislocation or a subluxation. They may have asymmetry in hip adduction, asymmetry in hip flexion, asymmetry in hip abduction, or there may be a unilateral foot propeller, which means they're using one foot to move the chair along. Now, in a later uh, webinar, I'm going to talk about the importance of assessing for hip abduction, hip flexion and hip adduction. So keep tuned in for that uh, forthcoming seminar. So what are the technical causes? The technical causes may well be that the trunk is not supported, that the back support does not support the posterior pelvis or the seat is too wide. So a windswept deformity is, uh, describes the abduction and external rotation position of one hip with the opposite hip in adduction and internal rotation. A windswept deformity may occur in association with hip dislocation and scoliosis. And the important thing that we will come up again, we'll discuss in future seminars, is that you need to establish, are these postures fixed or flexible? Because if you have a windswept deformity with, a, say, a kind or a child, you really need to accommodate that within the chair. But if it's flexible, we want to try to correct it within the chair. So fixed versus flexible will be discussed in future seminars. So uh, what are the problems associated with a windswept deformity? There's pain, loss of stability, loss of function, respiratory problems, pressure ulcers and swallowing problems. So I'm going to look now at three spinal presentations. And the first one is lordosis. And lordosis is usually associated with an anterior pelvic tilt. It's caused by increased tone in the hip flexors. It's associated with weakened abdominal muscles and people with lordosis usually complain of back pain. And the thing to remember about lordosis, as with all the conditions, we need to establish, is it fixed or is it flexible? because within the chair, we want to either accommodate this posture or we want to try to correct it. And I'm going to do practical demonstrations of fixed versus flexible in a future seminar. So scoliosis is the next spinal presentation. It's associated with a pelvic obliquity. It can be C-shaped or S-shaped and is associated with osteoporosis. So what we need to establish, is it fixed or is it correctable? Where do I need the support? And when I'm placing someone with a scoliosis in a chair, I need to be quite selective about where I put the lateral supports so that I'm giving opposite and equal pressure. And in, this, in the case of scoliosis, we would probably nearly always use the Phoenix chair because it gives maximum lateral and head support to give a nice midline position. So the next spinal presentation I want to talk about is kyphosis and that's a curvature of the upper thoracic spine. And again, is it fixed or is it flexible? And we, I will demonstrate this in future videos, how to assess for fixed versus flexible. But the important thing to, to know at this stage is if the kyphosis is fixed, we need to accommodate it in a chair that's going to support the spine. You cannot accommodate a kyphotic spine in a straight back chair. So a kyphosis is associated usually with a posterior pelvic tilt, as you can see from this diagram. It's associated with osteoporosis. It can cause reduced physiological functioning. It causes reduced oxygen saturation levels in the body, difficulty with feeding, difficulty with swallowing. And the, the client will present with like a humpback. So I'm going to finish off this part of our presentation today with a very, very important slide, and it's a slide on the hamstrings. And the hamstrings are a group of muscles that originate close to the posterior inferior surface of the ischial tuberosities. So again, the ischial tuberosities are these little prominence. So the hamstrings originate here, they travel down the leg and they insert below the knee uh, in the tibia and fibia which means they go over both the hip joint and the knee joint. And it's commonly overlooked. People tend to elevate the leg rest on a chair without looking at the hamstring range. So it's really important that you accommodate the hamstrings, that you check the hamstring range, because otherwise when you elevate the leg rest, you're going to pull the person into a posterior tilt and they're going to end up sitting on their sacrum, which is going to cause damage to their skin. So how do we accommodate hamstrings? We accommodate hamstrings 
by accommodating the angle of the knee and the angle of the hip. And in a future video, uh, in the next week or so, I'm going to demonstrate this practically on a chair, how to accommodate the hamstrings. So I hope you find this presentation useful and keep tuned in because we're going to elaborate on all these postures in future seminars.